um, uh, Mike is going to come <laughs> over, and please tell us who you may be, and uh, report. Tell us what you've come up with. Table 14. All right. We're at table 14. We are clearly the best table because mm -hmm. we were picked first. Yes, We clearly course. have the best Sierra leadership at our tables, so remember that. And we have an intern, so interns rock. So we did notice that uh, we do want more speed for everyone, not just for some, but we don't think too much. Being too greedy is a bad thing, and that uh, lack of infrastructure is causing a bigger divide among people. Um, we, we, di we discussed the... Um, uh, issue of seniors and their access, and we thought that was uh, significant. We can't just only focus on the middle of the bell curve. We have to um, um, uh, take care of the ends as well. We also uh, talked uh, briefly about the fact that higher speed gives us more room for innovation. In other words, if we only have slow speed, we can only try slow speed ideas. We have higher speed and then new ideas that come. And we need to have enough for everybody before we really push on the speed thing. So, and, and speed, we keep saying the word speed and I think what we all really meant was better because we recognize that just high speed is not got those latency issues or not has that consistency issues. So whenever we say the word internet speed, we mean internet better better in all forms. Upload as well as download, as well as latency, as well as consistency. And I think that's about it. Okay. Who can argue with that? I agree. No. All right. Table number, on the other side of the room, table number three. Table number three. Where have I got three? There's table three. <laughs> and here comes the microphone. <laughs> I have a loud voice usually, but not right now. Well, we um, have the microphone, don't forget, because we've got the webcasters are watching, so they'll course, hear you with the thank microphone. You. Um, so we had, a, we had a discussion, sort of a recap of where Canada ranks now, and then um, a little discussion and, uh, sort of emerged around uh, jurisdictional responsibility for advancement of the Internet in Canada, um, which, which made me think that, um, and, and we had a more fulsome discussion about the concept of trying to find some socio or economic drivers. So the one that came to mind was a social driver that involves multiple jurisdictions, and that would be healthcare. So if you think about an impetus for advancing not only the penetration, but also the quality of the internet in Canada, um, the opportunities for healthcare, which necessitate both high quality as well as extensive penetration, um, is something that all levels of government, as well as a large proportion of the populace, are extremely interested in. So, in terms of driving mobil political action, um, this would be a, a good a good source. And then we talked about the remote versus the urban, so there's telehealth and the remote communities. There's, um, there's also initiatives within the healthcare system to keep, which I think the previous speaker alluded to, to keep seniors in, the, in their homes in terms of uh, providing telehealth monitoring in the homes, which does produce rapidly dramatic results in terms of keeping them out of the emergency room and out of the beds in the tertiary care centers. Um, also, we talked about, um, you know, that uh, I can't remember what that third point was there. Yeah, I think I pretty well covered that. Um, yeah, and we also, the other topic we just started to touch on before you, uh, it's before you resumed, was uh, public-private networks in remote communities and to what extent that is in fact taking place in Canada. Um, I think we were a little bit data challenged on that uh, mm -hmm. on that topic. Yeah, I, I hope I'm not preempting anybody's uh, reporting here, but you mentioned jurisdictional issues, remote communities, and and one other thing, if you've read all the mandate letters, and, and that's my job, I had to do it, um, and it was interesting reading, let me tell you. 
uh, is that right across every single minister is a uh, new focus on Aboriginal issues. And the federal government, of course, in the last budget uh, provided a great deal of money for uh, infrastructure on our First Nations and uh, Inuit and, uh, communities. And um, I'm wondering, I don't know, maybe this is discussion for a reporter for me or for those in the business, to what extent are uh, capital investments being made in remote First Nations communities uh, for broadband? Of course, as you bring a fiber line, or if you bring some uh, broadband to some remote communities, presumably you will then help the non-native communities next door. Did you, did you touch on that a bit? Uh, yeah, we did. We did actually focus somewhat on Aboriginal communities for the reason you've just cited. Um, although mandate letters may be uh, new in Ottawa, where I'm from in British Columbia, they're, they're not, not new. new at all. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And Aboriginal issues figure in all the mandates of all of the ministers. Plus, we have the First Nations Health Authority, um, which has taken over the, what was previously, and I believe is only in British Columbia, mm -hmm. what, yeah, what was previously under um, uh, Abor Indian Affairs in Northern. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, BC is a model in many ways. Yeah. So some of those yes, the, the remote discussion did come out of uh, servicing Aboriginal communities, but they're not only Aboriginal communities that are remote. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, table number nine. Table nine. Swinging back again, which is in the center of the room. If there's a microphone handy, here comes the microphone. It's a somewhat uh, diffuse discussion, but basically three points. All right. First, um, discussion around if we had to do it again, would we do it the way we're doing it? And um, that there's a contrast or a stress between maximizing shareholder value um, in carriers and a government's role of keeping nets as neutral and healthy as possible. That was one theme. Second theme is some sort of champion was required to uh, uh, and the real question is, why do we need a champion? And I think we're not doing as well in network development as we might like. Which led to the third point, which was the centrality of communications networks is not yet fully perceived as an issue. Mandate letters are talking about all kinds of traditional industries, and yet the centrality of communication, better communications networks is not yet perceived as being sufficiently important, which led to a conclusion that we need a some kind of digital strategy which is uh, forward-looking and uh, coherent. Thank you. And I think uh, Chris mentioned that in his summing up on a national broadband strategy would be a useful thing to think about. Can I just ask you about your champion required? Uh, what was the table sort of thinking on that? Uh, are we thinking jurisdictional, uh, a private sector, a particular individual, like a minister? What was your thinking on what kind of, what kind of champion are you envisioning? We didn't specify the solution. And um, I think people would, might have different ideas at the table as to uh, who or what force that would be, but there needs to be something to start thinking about this and developing. To drive discussion, sure. Yes. Okay, great. Who knows, maybe Byron, that's one more thing you can add to Sira's list of things to do. Champion all of this. Um, there we go. Um, all right, and I think we, we might have maybe, uh, maybe one or two more. Uh, table five is next. Where's table five? There's table five. It's in the back if the microphone can work its way down there. Hi, I'm Lynn Hamilton. Ooh, I am using my big girl voice. Um, <laughs> and I am the president of the Internet Society Canadian chapter. So the fabulous table number five had this to say. We touched on exactly what you just mentioned with Chris Tassett talking about the broadband federalism initiative and how it's, the 500 million is great. I mean, it's forward looking, it's more than anybody's ever offered, but it really does have to be the three orders of government's responsibility in conjunction with the ABO First Nations to really put together a strategy that's going to be comprehensive and forward looking and 20 years out, much the way we would have done with the railway back in the day. But unless that happens, we're going to continue to be leapfrogged over. Uh, in the OCD rankings. So many at the table felt that we absolutely needed more firsts for Canada again, that we need to be a leader again. There was general agreement on where the internet ends, so does the prosperity. So especially in our native communities, but especially in our rural and remote, the minute you have those slower speeds, the minute you are now not an innovator, you are not moving forward. We love that uh, the stuff that Coquitlam is doing, is, and we believe that that's a model that needs to be replicated across Canada and in many other municipalities, and that's the role that municipalities can play when we're dealing with those three or four levels of government, uh, that the internet is a necessity for prosperity, growth, and jobs, 
and that all sort of filtered into that part. But then, then the next conversation was a lot about the changing nature of employment and how distressing that was and that we don't think that the interests of the kids coming out of school today are playing into the kind of ICT jobs in the sector and it's not a good match. That the, that the folks that we're pumping out of the schools aren't, make, aren't meeting the needs of the jobs, which is why even as those jobs are shrinking, and we heard the suggestion today, there's going to be you know, a third of the people doing the work necessary because you only need so many people now. The companies today are you know, a tenth of the size that they were pre-2000. Uh, and how are we going to make sure that the education sector is responding and making sure that we're not pumping out, said the girl with the English degree, uh, that we're not pumping out many uh, liberal arts. I mean, somebody's got to sell it. Right? At the mm -hmm. end of the day, I know somebody in here is going to be brilliant and create the next app, but I'm going to sell it. So we can still have those folks in place. But we do need to make sure that we are pumping out the grads necessary and that we're doing it at the earliest levels, that things like coding in schools and all of those things need to be happening so that we are making sure that there's not only interest, but we have the skill match to meet the next generation of jobs. And any discussion on the gender issue, that often comes up when we talk about the skill match in this industry. Is it still heavily male for the engineering, et cetera? Need coding for girls programs, things like that? So you hit on, in my other job, I also run a women's organization dedicated to getting more women elected. So uh, it touches my heart, and we do want to make sure that it's, it's hard to get women interested in that kind of stuff, and I think that has to start in kindergarten. My now 11-year-old loves coding. We don't call it that. We called it, you know, how to make Barbie move when she was four. Right. right. So it's how do we make sure that the education sector and other folks are, are making that palatable to young women so that they don't see it as something else. That we're making sure that the educators are pumping it out in a way that's going to be compelling to the new young grads or children of, right? But I think you're absolutely right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's great. Um, let's see. Let's try to squeeze one more in before we get to our next panel discussion. And we'll go to table number 10. 10, if there's a microphone there right down front here. Uh, table number 10. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll make ours uh, pretty quick because we didn't have a lot of time to uh, talk about oh, it. Oh, that's started, your excuse, started, isn't it? <laughs> started right. a little okay. bit late. Um, the, um, uh, the one uh, big thing that came out of the first panel uh, uh, was the, uh, the thing we were really interested in was the uh, spider web uh, graph uh, and how well we did uh, in open data. But the one thing that came out of that was um, uh, how well, the one question that came out of that was how well do we do in terms of having that open data accessible uh, on a broad spectrum? Is it uh, really only available to the big guys that uh, can really process that data or is there a way for smaller companies uh, who are innovators to uh, really have the resources to process the, the, the types of data that are available. Uh, and I think when we had the second panel up, you saw a lot of uh, innovators on that panel, uh, people like uh, uh, Ice Wireless and um, uh, was it uh, OneWeb? OneWeb, yes. Yeah. Um, so when you when you have your innovators and you're not giving them access uh, to the same tools that the big guys have, you're disabling the people that are uh, changing, uh, really changing the industry and pushing the industry forward, right? Uh, so we really want to create a situation, I think, where the, um, uh, the people who will be the disruptors, the people that will drive the industry forward, do have access um, to all of the same tools uh, that the um, uh, that the bigger traditional players have always had access to, and that's what the internet's supposed to be all about: giving e equalizing things. That's great. Okay, well that's super. That's uh, some good stuff. I know the Sierra folks are going to be taking all of this back. Um, uh, some of you tables that didn't get to report this time, we have another sort of session for this uh, later on. Um, I'm going to invite our panelists for our next panel up on the stage, and we'll get ready to uh, go for that uh, in just a second.
Did, really? They went, you went Gapo with Kapow? No. Kapow. Hi. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Yes. Excellent. I like that. Sorry, I should have. complicated all these big panels I want to make sure I have the right names with the right biographies etc um, so are what we're talking about today then is it just a technology and infrastructure problem or are there other things more things that have to be done to position Canada for its full participation in the new digital economy does everyone have access to broadband are we producing the skilled workers that the digital economy needs the OECD has said that education and training systems are core to innovation and productivity, including in realizing the benefits of the next production revolution. However, OECD assessments show that, on average, only one-third of all adults have the skills necessary for a technology-rich environment. Data from CIRA's survey of IT decision makers supports this. In that survey, four in ten said that it is difficult for their organization to recruit or hire IT professionals. Almost one half say their organization has had difficulty filling IT positions in the last year. You heard Byron talk about CIRA, where some of these jobs go unfilled for months at a time. Almost nine in 10, 88%, believe it is important that students are taught basic programming and coding skills in high school. The ability to recruit and retain skilled workers are most likely to be considered important for helping Canadian technology companies compete globally. So those are some of the issues that we're going to dig into uh, with this panel. And I'll introduce the panel and then we'll, we'll hear uh, from each of them first. Jeff White is uh, counsel at the Public Interest Advocacy Centre, PIAC. I've used them many times. They're a great resource and a great help to journalists. And uh, Jeff provides advice and representation on legal and regulatory matters with a current focus on telecommunications, broadcasting, competition, and privacy. Tanya Woods is the Vice President of Policy and Legal Affairs at the Entertainment Software Association of Canada, and she's responsible for ensuring that Canadian federal and provincial policies and legislation support the thriving multi-platform video game industry in Canada. And it's a big industry, folks, for those who are not aware of it. Sarah Anson Cartwright, right next to, we're going right down the line there, uh, is with the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, where she is responsible for policy development and advocacy in the areas of skills, training, education, and immigration policy. That is the sweet spot, I think, right now, Sarah, for a whole bunch of pol policy discussions the feds are having. And Matthew Johnson is Director of Education at Media Smarts. He is the author of many Media Smarts lessons, materials for parents, and interactive resources. He is a lead on Media Smarts uh, Young Canadians uh, in a Wired World uh, project. And sitting way down at the end, uh, playing the role that uh, Chris played in the uh, last group is uh, Jeremy, Jeremy DePoe, and he's the executive director and founder of Canada's uh, Digital Policy Forum. So Jeremy's job, he doesn't know what he's going to say yet because he needs to listen to everybody else and then try and sum it up and provide us with some takeaways at the end of it all. So that's our panel. And again, uh, welcome once more, I should have said, to our online audience. We have folks who are watching this via webcast. All right, we're starting with Jeff White. Jeff, lots of uh, news about gaps in the availability and issues with affordability and broadband. Um, I'm assuming you were, if you weren't at those CRTC hearings, you were probably glued to them to see what was being said. Um, give us your sense of where we stand. Do you see some, first the gaps and some solutions? Sure, we'll do. Uh, just first, thanks uh, to Sira for the invitation, uh, and thanks for your excellent moderation. Uh, and Thank for taking you. away from Parliament Hill, it's not like there's yes, any shortage of drama awesome. yeah. there today. Um, I should add to my biography uh, in reference to Lynn. I am also a proud uh, liberal artist. Um, so I represent. Uh, I'm external counsel to the Public Interest Advocacy, Advocacy Center (PIAC), which has been around for 30 years. Uh, advocating for the consumer and public interest in areas related to telecom broadcasting, privacy, and energy. Uh, I, I was co-counsel to a group called the Affordable Access Coalition before the CRTC, so I was at the hearings, uh, and I was also glued to those hearings, and I'm still glued to them. 
um, because it winds up in about a week with final reply arguments. So the Affordable Access Coalition uh, consisted of about five groups, PIAC, two uh, senior citizens groups, ACORN Canada, which is a low income uh, advocacy group, and the Consumers Association of Canada, which is a national consumer uh, advocacy organization. Um, CRTC was consulting and has been consulting for almost a year now on uh, how to define quote unquote basic telecommunications services. And that's uh, effectively in furtherance of one of the key Canadian telecom policy objectives, which is to render reliable and affordable telecom services of high, qualities, of high quality to all Canadians, regardless of the, the region that they, they live in. Um, and so the coalition I represented advocated to the CRTC basically that there's four key steps that they should do. Um, they should update this definition of basic telecom service. And that's important because that definition basically sets an expectation for the, what telecom services all Canadians can reasonably expect to access. So we said, step one, please declare broadband of at least 10 megabits per second download and one megabit per second upload, if not three, to be a basic telecom service. Um, step two, create a deployment fund. There, there, there's already a fund that exists to help uh, with telephone, providing telephone service to high cost serving areas. Internet uh, is, is so much more than the new telephone, but the, the model exists to fund telephone to higher cost service areas. So we said, take that model, adapt it, include broadband in that, and provide a subsidy to willing service providers to go out to the hard to reach rural, exurban, remote areas, et cetera, with that basic level of broadband. Step three, uh, implement a subsidy for low-income Canadians because we, we offered a lot of evidence um, from the client group Acorn Canada, but also from, from the online forum and uh, uh, one or two surveys that we commissioned through Enveronics, um, that Canadians and low-income Canadians are really hurting when it comes to paying for internet service. Uh, if, if they don't already have access, which is a huge problem, especially in these rural and remote areas, actually paying for broadband service is becoming a big problem. The average Canadian household spends $204 a month, uh, excuse me if I'm, I'm off a little bit, but I think it's 204 around there a month on communication services. Low-income Canadians are reporting that they are sacrificing things so that they can afford their broadband. And, and at another conference I was at, I presented some of the handwritten testimonials of some of these people who are saying this is incredibly important to us. This isn't just about Netflix or entertainment, which is, a, a, which is being used as a sort of a term to trivialize whether or not high-speed internet is a need or it's just a, a luxury or a want. People talking about sacrificing food budgets and medicine budgets to afford broadband, and I think that's just absolutely um, is something we should be ashamed of. And so the fourth thing that the Affordable Access Coalition said to the CRTC is this, you've got to do something. Okay, the standard uh, target that the, the commission set in uh, 2011 for five megabits per second, which about 5% of Canadians still don't have access to, that's no longer gonna cut it anymore. If you look at how many people live on average in a household, three people, the number of connected devices you have in a house, nine, uh, the floor should be 10 megabits per second. And that's actually what most Canadians already take for granted having access to at a minimum. I'm not talking about the maximum one gig that you can get in, in downtown um, certain, of certain cities. So the subject for me, it was problems and solutions to the, uh, to access, the accessibility of broadband. So what, is, what do we mean when we say accessibility? And I, when I hear that word, I think accessibility is about five things. There's a, a accessibility in the sense of access, physical access to a broadband service from your house. There's socioeconomic access. I mean, can you actually afford to pay for your broadband service? Can you afford it in the first place? Do you have to make sacrifices to get it? Are you hurting in some way so that you can get access to that vital service? Uh, then there's accessibility in the sense of accessibility for those who have um, perhaps different visual or hearing capacities or learning disabilities and things like that. That's not something the coalition I represented focused on, but there were a number of very compelling interventions from, from groups that advocate for, for, for 
persons with different abilities so that they could also access um, broadband. And that, that's to do with um, the accessibility in terms of the visuals, but also the functionality in terms of data caps and things like that, because some of the services that, that people uh, may use require a lot more bandwidth for, to, to enable that functionality. And then there's access in the sense of, um, the fourth access in the sense of being able to put the technology and the functionality to use. I mean, that's just, a, a, I guess, a synonym for, for digital literacy. And finally, uh, there's access in the sense of people actually taking full advantage of the connectivity, assuming that it's there. And that, I, that I, I think, is what the adoption issue is. And it's the digital economy issue. And it's whether or not we can all uh, start the next Google and Facebook and, and Shopify from our basements. Um, the Affordable Access Coalition was, was more focused in, before the CRTC on the first two of those access barriers. Um, the physical access, making sure the facilities are there so you can actually subscribe to the service, and then the, the socioeconomic access, the affordability. Um, so, and to, to address those proposed two funding mechanisms, looking at what had already been done in Canada in terms of the plain old telephone service, but also looking at what other industries have been doing in other leading jurisdictions in terms of paying for universal access, um, and also supporting low-income Canadians. And we proposed that the CRTC do this, and we surveyed Canadians in terms of their views on how they felt about some of these issues. The vast majority of Canadians think all Canadians should have access to broadband no matter where they live. The vast majority of Canadians think uh, High-speed internet should be affordable to low-income Canadians. The vast majority of Canadians um, are okay with the idea of paying a little bit more every, every month to support this notion of, of universal service. Everybody having access to broadband, everyone and low-income Canadians having um, affordable access to it. Now, I'm not I'm not saying these are anyone sold on these ideas. There's there's lots of uh, criticism. Uh, there's criticism about the idea of ten. One being, some, some in the industry say 10.1 is a ludicrously high standard and 5.1 download is all you need. Um, there are others that say, no, that's, that's crazy. This is Canada, we've got to sh really sh shoot, for the, shoot for the stars and it's got to be 100 down or 100 symmetrical, things like that. But of course, the CRTC has a very specific mandate under its, under its legislation, the, the Telecommunications Act. Um, and its focus really is on basic telecommunications service. So that's why we were focusing on, on sort of that, it, it's too high for the, the industry, but it's too low for other people, that 10-1 minimum service to shoot for. Um, there are two divides in Canada. I've talked, you know, the Affordable Access Coalition is homage to those two divides, and, and it was very nice to hear Minister Baines before the Empire Club recently talking about those two divides uh, in the sense that there's people who don't have access uh, where, when they need it and they want it, and there are people um, who are hurting when it comes to being able to afford broadband. So I'm just going to wrap up by saying, in terms of what, um, you know, I just want to wrap up by saying, in terms of adoption, getting people to harness the full potential of connectivity and digital skills, um, we said to the CRTC, that's not really, that's not really something you should prioritize. It's not really uh, in your legislation. The legislation in the Telecom Act is focused on existing users, not non-users. We think there'd be a whole host of problems in terms of actually identifying uh, people who are interested in using broadband but don't know how. In the surveys we did, um, second to personal choice, affordability was the biggest issue when it came to non-adoption. And there's, a, there's an FCC report from 2011 which showed that affordability and cost is the biggest barrier to being online and, and getting online. Um, and we think also, you know, there's just, there are still some people who say it's not for me. And, you know, there are, there's a percentage of people who say, I don't know how to do it, and that's why I'm not online. But there are people who say, I'm not online at home because I have access at work, or I'm just not interested. I think over time, demographic forces are going to sort that out. It's becoming increasingly impossible to live these days without having those digital skills. Uh, and the school system is starting to take up that cause, I believe, and I, and I think we're going to hear more about that. Um, but in terms of digital skills, I, I'll just leave you this final remark. Every, the focus always seems to be on the digital economy and producing people who are good at using the services. And the definition of digital literacy um, is very much sort of skill and labor market focused. And that's entirely a valid concern of everybody. Um, 
But I think we need to take a, a broader look at digital literacy um, and, and make sure that the people also understand the role of technology in shaping democratic institutions and the role that technology plays in everyone's life and society. Um, and start asking questions. And, and these are issues to do with uh, privacy, for example, understanding the way networks are working, underway, understanding the way networks and technology can be used in abusive ways to sort people into different categories. Now, that's not my issue. I think it's, there are a number of academics who are taking up this cause, but I'll, I'll, I'll just challenge people when they're talking about digital skills and literacy to, 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 to not ignore, uh, ignore having a definition of digital literacy that includes giving expression to some of the values that we've agreed as a collective society. Thanks, Those Jeff. Are my I, I just keep pointing out because I keep thinking about these things. You may not know this, but uh, for the first time this parliamentary session, you can submit a petition electronically to your MP, and you can gather petitions electronically, digitally. Um, that's a first. And of course, with the discussions about electoral reform, online voting is part of it, and all this comes to, again, access, uh, digital literacy on some basic acts of citizenship. Um, English majors and coders usually meet in the gaming industry, I'm, I'm assuming. <laughs> this is where you get, uh, I need the myths. I'm going to encode Stories. the myths in the game. Stories, telling, exactly. So Tanya Woods, you tell us all about the, uh, what is a huge industry? I don't think you, you, you probably evangelize about this a lot. This is You're a doing very, a good job, though. Thank you, because <laughs> I have a son and daughter who like to play a lot of games. And, they, and do you play? Some. Not There's really. no shame in it. I know. So Tanya There's Woods, no tell us about the, uh, <laughs> the, the industry in Canada. Sure. Um, so I have some slides because the nerdy lawyer in me just needs to have slides to feel good about things. So they're here, but there's lots of pictures, I promise. Um, you've done a good job introducing me, so I'm not going to waste any time doing it again. But how many people in the room play video games? On your computers? On your phones? On other devices? That's it. It's good. Um, the average player is 31, and it's divided almost evenly between men and women. So we aren't boys in basements anymore, um, and I'm going to share with you a little bit more about what we are. So our organization um, represents the industry in Canada. Um, we have 24 of the largest employers, um, most successful companies in the world that we work with most closely. So you see um, on the screen behind me, um, I hope that online you can see this as well. Some of our um, big players, which I'm sure many of you would know, but there's also some pretty successful independents that we're really proud to have on our, in our kind of back pockets, which is Roadhouse, um, Silverback, of course, Other Ocean, um, United Front, and others that are spread across Canada. So these are developers, publishers, distributors, console uh, manufacturers, and they're employing over 90% of the people that are employed in our industry. Um, so here is a bit of a snapshot of the industry itself, 472 studios, we're growing, we're growing like crazy in Canada. Um, you can see the stats uh, on the right, it would be your right, um, up 143 since 2013, which isn't that long ago. We're contributing $3 billion to the GDP in Canada, um, up 31% in the last basically two years, because this is with reference to 2015 um, numbers. Most of our business is export driven. Um, we're the third, we don't typically say, but we are the third largest um, industry globally with Japan and the US leading ahead of us, um, which says something. We don't talk about how great we are very often as Canadians, but we're really, really good at video games. Um, and 36,500 people are powering, um, powering that industry here and making it possible for us to be really, really, really good. Why are we so successful? Um, it's a great question that I get asked pretty frequently. I don't know if anybody has some ideas, but I can tell you that it starts with our talent um, and our favorable business climate. So Canada, if you think of Montreal, Vancouver, um, Toronto, the East Coast, Nova Scotia, um, and frankly, it's scattered throughout the country. There isn't really one central space, um, although all of those places would love to say it's their people and their town that make it the best. Um, but we're really, really talented people. We're creative, we're hardworking. Um, we want to be the best. There's, there's just a drive and ambition like no other, um, and we're willing to put in the work. So it's no surprise that you know Warner Brothers, which is a very large organization, decided to stick its studio in Montreal, and 
you know, we've got a nice picture of the East Coast. Ubisoft just expanded out to Nova Scotia. Um, the campus at the bottom with the soccer pitch is EA. It had a soccer pitch before Google did, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so there, just saying. Um, and of course, NHL is made in Canada, one of the all-time best sports games. Um, and our studios are very attractive, probably much like the places many of you work. But uh, we have some problems. We need people. Uh, we need people a lot more um, than maybe other sectors would like to say that they need people. But uh, the reality is there's an organization called ICTC, um, which I hope all of you know of. If not, we can talk about it later. But they've been doing labor market research in Canada for a long time in the ICT space. And they've identified at least 200,000 skilled ITC, uh, ICT workers needed by 2020. That's less than four years. You can't produce a dev in four years. It's almost impossible. Um, if they don't have the skills now, it's gonna take a while to get them. I think the average stat that I saw last was about 10 years to develop significant skills to be able to contribute in an intermediate or high skilled position. So that's not good. Uh, there's a crisis. There's in fact a global shortage, which Sarah I'm sure is gonna talk a little bit more about. Um, but it has impacted us. We've got about 1,500 vacancies coming up in our industry. And the reality for us today is that we're not just competing anymore with ourselves. We're actually competing with LinkedIn, with Google, with Facebook, um, Shopify, I mean, all kinds of other folks who wanna gamify the experience for users because it's fun, it works, and we kind of invented gamification, I think. Um, and so, what happens there is we start losing our talent and we're not even just losing them to other Canadian companies or companies based in Canada, but we're losing them globally because there's just so much more attractive salaries or benefits or what have you um, that we're really struggling here. So our leadership position um, is very fragile and we, we're always looking to protect it. So why does this matter? Like, we're boys in basements, right? Why does this actually matter? And there's a lot of reasons why it matters that we have a talent shortage and a skill shortage. And um, I've put up some pictures here just to kind of hope that this resonates. But you know, if I said to you, what do you think this girl with the headset on is doing? How many of you would say playing a game? Don't be shy. Just a few playing a game? OK. Um, is she solving a world problem? We hope she is, but she's not. Um, she's actually climbing Mount Everest. Um, with her virtual reality headset and she's getting some physical activity and she's experiencing something she may never get to experience in her life. Um, and the experiential learning that's happening um, in large part in our industry directly but also peripherally um, is pretty impressive. I mean you can take anybody from anywhere where they're physically located and take them to do anything around the world and that's amazing when you really think about it. Um, I know courtside seats at a Lakers game is kind of my objective, but I think that's coming too, so, you know. Um, but you can also find new ways to educate people, um, and video games and our industry has seen a lot of success around the world. So in the UK, kids are super active um, playing video games and learning digital skills. Here we're seeing um, in the gym, uh, this is girls, uh, because there is a heavy emphasis to get more, more girls engaged in in tech skills and break down some stereotypes early, but they're learning coding there and they're not even on a computer. They're not typing away, they're not coding, they're using their feet and learning directional logic. Um, we're also seeing a lot of crossover uh, of our industry into other sectors like health, defense, um, and many others. So it's not boys and basins anymore and we're incredibly relevant to develop talent um, and to drive innovation. And of course, in the corner shot, um, you see some dudes in suits. Uh, you might recognize them, but there are a lot of parliamentary folks. So we're really trying to explain why the failure of our industry would be a huge failing in Canada, um, and we really need to keep the momentum going. So wouldn't you rather be connected? I mean, I came in um, this afternoon. Unfortunately, I missed this morning's presentations. Lynn could have probably done this for me, given her comments at the table. So thank you. I have to say less now. Um, but the reality is, I think we'd all rather be connected. And understanding the possibilities of connection only come, of course, with access, um, but they need skills. I mean, if you don't have the tools to paint your picture, if you don't have the know-how or the comfort level to pick up something that's not new and not familiar, you're probably never gonna do it, and then everybody loses out. It's not just you. So we're big proponents of connection. We're big proponents of empowerment and enabling people to take up their dreams. To that end, I do want to um, give a nod to Sira because 
We looked at skills. Um, we started really proactively working on it. We've got a study we've done, which I've got copies of if you'd like them. Um, at the late end of last year, we knew there was a new government, of course, and we knew this might be our chance to move the needle on the dial and actually make a real impact and a real difference in Canada. And we had seen what was going on around the world. So the video game industry has basically, um, on its own, it's very proactive with schools, it has been with decades, um, gone out and decided, you know what, if we teach girls to make games, specifically putting an emphasis on girls, because the way the education system is now, there's a bias maybe against them perhaps in the curriculum that's available or the opportunities they have to learn video games. Um, that if we teach these girls, we'll show them it's not that scary, we'll build some confidence, and hopefully they'll just soar. Um, and so we set up Girl Force in Ottawa, which is just that. It's the video game industry locally that's empowering girls. Um, they've applied. We had an incredible amount of applicants to learn how to make a video game as a way to express themselves, to learn a new skill, and Sierra has been so gracious to host us there, so thank you for that. But this is a great example of industry coming together to solve a problem. And the education system, I mean, we've put a lot of weight on it. We'll talk about it a little bit more. It can only move so fast. There's politics involved and legislative issues that we've got to get over. Um, but industry has a lot of power in its hands. And so finding opportunities to collaborate, working together, talking. Um, you know, this isn't like a fight or, or a, comp a competition, really, between companies. Although we could make it one and maybe make it really fun. But um, I think there's a lot of creativity that if we're going to solve our own problems, which is that we need people and we need great innovators and inspiration and engagement, um, we are going to have to take it up into our own hands. So I encourage all of you to take a step forward and help out. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, Sarah Anson Cartwright, Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Um, if I hear from the Canadian manufacturers and exporters, I hear from the CFIB, skills, skills, skills. It doesn't matter the industry and digital even more so. Tell us uh, what you've brought on this. So, um, you know, I, I arrived here a few minutes ago. I overheard some of the table discussions. I don't think I'm going to be able to tell you anything you don't already know. So apologies right up front. This is a, a great group, uh, very well informed. But I will go back to a, first, a few first principles. And at first I'm going to start with a few phrases, some of my favorite phrases when we talk about this topic. And this is with the apologies to the OECD. So um, am I smarter than a smartphone? It's a good question to ask ourselves, right? Um, it's not what we know. It's what we can do with what we know. And the third one, just to broaden it out, is the future of work requires a change to how we think about skills. So pretty basic, pretty fundamental to this discussion. And I'm going to pull it back up to a topic that David talks about, if he's not talking about parliamentary affairs, and that is the economy. And it really does come down to how we look at the opportunity for growth. And, and you know, if you look at um, one formula for our, uh, our GDP growth, it would be the growth in our labor force and the growth in our labor productivity. And we know that the labor force growth, the population growth, is pretty flat, 0.4, 0 0.5, a And we also know that labor productivity growth is, is very low, you know, hovering around one point something. And what we do know, though, is that of those two, we have greater influence potentially on later labor productivity. And the great thing about ICT is it's that general purpose technology. It pervades the entire economy. It can be applied in every part of the economy, and we should see some productivity growth. We haven't, but we should, you know, on balance. And so I think that's where the notion of how do we get beyond digital skills as kind of the standalone topic, and it becomes an embedded topic around skills, around education, around our, our economic growth. Uh, because that is a factor that we can influence. And I think uh, what I'd like to talk about a little bit later is, where's the federal government's role in this? Is there a federal government role? I think there is, and that's my job, uh, to make the case. And um, I, I've 
uh, fortunately, uh, Tanya is one of our members, and Tanya is very eloquent. She's giving you the great slides to excite you about the skills gap, so I don't need to go there. I can now go and talk about, when we talk about digital skills, we're not just talking about the skills that allow you to use technology. We have to talk about two fundamental skills that allow you to actually you know, do something with that digital skill. And as much as we're remiss, and David quoted the, the, uh, the lack of digital skills in our population, we're equally, if not more so, uh, poor performers when it comes to literacy and numeracy. And this is across our adult working age population. Less than half have the level of literacy, and no, sorry, less than half have the uh, problem solving in a digital rich or a technology rich environment. That's the way the OECD characterizes it. So less than half have good enough skills to actually use ICT, to actually use whatever form of technology is required in their work. And then you bring it back to the literacy and numeracy and you see the connections because our levels of literacy and numeracy are not where they need to be for the functions, for the tasks of most jobs. And then you look back at younger people and you say, well, aren't we doing better? Isn't it a generational divide? Is this sort of improving as we, as we embed more uh, technology in, into our education system and sort of allow this to thrive? And isn't every 11-year-old you know, so much better at everything than I am on a computer or anything else? of a digital nature. And the fact is, our numeracy uh, scores have been going down. We're not so bad at, for 15-year-olds at the, at the literacy and uh, the reading, you know, those components, the problem solving, but the, the numeracy, which is a fundamental underpinning. So, you know, I think if we can just come back to some first principles on this uh, issue, uh, there's a lot of strong connections you have to have cognitive skills. It's not just about knowing how to push a button or, or knowing how to use some device. It's about actually saying, what can I do now that I have that device? It's the problem solving, critical thinking, there's creativity. So we've got this sort of myriad, and I think, I think uh, you know, there's, there's a lot that needs to be unpacked, as we say. But the more we can embed the relationship between digital skills as sort of a fundamental piece of the skill set we need, and it has to be in our education system, because if we don't catch people then early, it's very hard to play catch up. We see you know, that the graphs are pretty dramatic in terms of skill loss as we get older. You know, you kind of peak in the 35 to 44, and then, you know, as you get older, it all goes downhill. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm just, you know, showing you, telling you what the, the graphs show us. Um, today at the OECD, I see they have their OECD forum. My boss is over there. Um, and, you know, their session on the future of work, what do they do? They start off by bringing a robot right out on to the panel, you know, so just to make the statement pretty clear. We're racing with the robots. It's about technology alongside skills. How do we differentiate ourselves? It has to be in terms of those problem solving, analytical, uh, other skills of a cognitive nature that are in many cases interpersonal, uh, so that we're coming to, you know, direct those robots as opposed to doing their bidding. Anyway, I've gone off on a tangent here. Um, I should come back to our, our topic at hand. How are we faring? I think I gave you a bit of a, a sense that I'm, I'm quite concerned. Um, and the OECD, uh, the OECD surveys, give us really good indications about where Canada falls relative to our competitors. And, you know, we're, as a country, we're often very complacent. And I just don't know how we step away from that, what will encourage us to really, you know, take this seriously. But, but the one, you know, role I think the federal government can play here 
is to push out some very strong messages, to warn us, to shock us. Maybe Dominic Barton and that council at the end of the year when they report back will give us a real coming to terms with what we need to do as a country. But I think our skills opportunity is, is, is really critical here. Um, so, uh, David, if I have a, another minute? Thank you. Uh, you mentioned Indigenous peoples, and I think that's a really interesting area. If you want to bring some attention to this, this uh, digital skills, IT skills, ICT issue, let's look at the difference that education make, makes to Aboriginal peoples. Their skill proficiency is on a par with non-Aboriginals where they are uh, co-located or having the same education system. When you step back and look at the on-reserve situation, that's where it falls to pieces. So it's not about, you know, who's brighter or less bright. It is about the quality of the education and the skills gap uh, that you see between generations uh, is also, uh, you know, one that, that we, uh, we need to take note of. Because if we're going to assume that we need older workers to stay working longer, we can't just ignore them in terms of where their skills are at. So I think that's another piece is we have the technology. Can we actually do something about this continuous learning uh, need, this deficit that we have in our system. And, um, you know, the last thing I would say, if I may, is we're all of a certain, you know, age range, shall we say, uh, and we think, oh, you know, uh, I was fine, my father was fine, you know, they got this type of education, they, you know, they did well. If we don't come to terms with the fact that, you know, a, a BA or, or one type of discipline is not going to hold you in good stead. It has to be interdisciplinary. You have to have a range of skills. You may not get on the job training. You may. I've had a varied experience depending on firms. But let's not assume any of this. Let's assume that we're changing jobs more often. We need to continuously up our skills and we need to find ways, we need the government to find ways to help individuals do more of that themselves for their own benefit. I'm losing my voice. That's a sign to stop. Thank All right. you. Well, we're definitely going to come back to you with some questions, Sarah. Matthew Johnson, you're sort of where the rubber meets the road in some of these, where the, you're an educator. Give us a sense of what it looks like from educator meeting educated in some of these. Sure. Well, we've heard a number of times in this panel already the term digital literacy. And perhaps you've gotten the sense that this is a term whose precise meaning is still being developed. For the, for the past several years, Media Smarts has been developing a comprehensive definition of digital literacy in a Canadian context. So what does digital literacy mean in Canada? Now, while digital literacy has traditionally been seen in technical terms primarily, our approach is to view it as a suite of life skills that enable a digitally literate person to successfully navigate and engage with our increasingly networked world. More and more of our lives, from political debates to accessing health information and services to finding employment, keeping in touch with our family and friends, are all moving online. And more and more of our time is spent using screens and network devices. Of course, this does have its benefits access to previously unimaginable sources of information, art, and entertainment, opportunities for citizens to become involved in government, civic, and political causes, and to bridge both geography and socioeconomics in bringing people together. To take advantage of these, though, we need four things. First, access to networks and network devices, which we consider a precondition of digital literacy. Then, what we've identified as the three key components of digital literacy. The competence in using digital tools, from search engines to social networks. The skill to understand the content 
that we access, not just on a surface level, but in a critically engaged way that draws on media literacy skills to recognize how both the commercial nature of the spaces we use and the technical architecture of the networked world influence that content. And finally, the ability to create content using those digital tools. When looked at from that perspective, how digitally literate are Canadians? Our young Canadians in a Wired World survey looked at students from grades 4 to 11, whom we might expect as so-called digital natives, to be highly digitally literate relative to older Canadians. In the first category, access, we did find that the great strides taken by Canadian governments in the early days of the internet have not necessarily been followed up on. While nearly all the youth in our stu study did tell us that they were able to access the internet outside of school, our qualitative data suggests that the 1% that report not having access may reflect quite large rural and northern parts of the country. The picture inside schools, meanwhile, is significantly worse. In our survey of nearly 5,000, oh, sorry, more than 5,000 K-12 teachers, we heard again and again frustration with slow and unreliable networks and out-of-date or poorly chosen technology. It goes without saying that schools are where youth have the best chance of learning the, digitally li the digital literacy skills that they need, not just those they think they need. And we would be right to be concerned about a situation where teenagers are significantly more digitally connected at times when they're away from guidance and supervision. These issues are even more present in northern and remote schools, but many other, maybe uh, many urban schools, especially ones with older buildings or those that rely heavily on portable classrooms, face similar challenges as well. The lack of access in schools is not just a barrier to students becoming digitally literate, though. It also builds a wall between the classroom and students' already wired lives, making school seem less and less relevant. There's no question, of course, that Canadians of all ages are using network technology, but whether they're using it well is another matter. Search engines are a good example. While Google's one of the most popular websites among students, just over a third use advanced search engine tools, and only half scan the full first page of search engine results before clicking on one. Similarly, while students demonstrate fairly sophisticated abilities to use social networks tagging and blocking features and privacy settings to manage what information about them is seen by their friends, family, and community, something of obvious relevance to young people, they generally overestimate how much these sites' privacy policies limit how their data may be used by the companies that own those sites. Teachers are most likely to emphasize the responsible and ethical use of digital technology, an important part of digital literacy. The three topics that they consider most important for students to learn are staying safe online, appropriate online behavior, and dealing with cyberbullying. But most efforts by governments at all levels to address these issues have been framed in negative, punitive contexts and relied heavily on scare tactics, all of which are elements that we know make youth tune them out to encourage youth to be responsible users of network technology, we need to stop trying to scare them into following the rules and instead teach them to know and exercise their rights as informed and engaged digital citizens. To do that, we need to do a better job of teaching them to understand and create digital media. The understand skills can be seen as a bright point in the digital literacy landscape. Students and teachers agree on the value of being able to verify the information they see online, and most students do know and use a number of different techniques for doing this. But here, too, there's a gap between school and the rest of students' lives, with authentication being seen primarily as a matter for the classroom. While 9 in 10 students verify information they need for schoolwork, only two-thirds do so for information they're seeking for their personal uh, interest, and just over half verify anything they learn through social media, the main source of news for youth and an increasing number of adults as well. 
more and more, the internet is where politics happens. And authentication skills, especially the soft skills of recognizing bias, loaded language, and how a source may be compromised by who's funding it, are essential not just to being a digital citizen, but a citizen full stop. For the same reason, to be involved in civic life today means contributing to the online commons by creating digital media. Despite the fact that the internet has removed the stranglehold that publishers and broadcasters once held on getting the message out, however, and the fact that we can now do with a cell phone what 20 years ago required a camcorder that might cost hundreds or thousands of dollars, relatively few youth are creating content in or out of school. So what needs to be done about this? Well, for our part, Media Smarts has launched a model curriculum framework that addresses seven key aspects of digital literacy, from authenticating information, to creating and remixing, to ethical use, and dealing with the physical and mental health aspects of network technology. To make sure that every Canadian child can have a comprehensive digital literacy education from kindergarten to grade 12. As well as trying to lead in curriculum development, we've identified where digital literacy is already in the curriculum of each province and territory as a way of removing obstacles to getting it in the classroom. And we provide professional development for teachers on key digital literacy topics. We also provide resources for parents to help them provide the kind of guidance and support that we know young people want and which our research shows has the strongest relationship with what kids actually do online. Now, we created our framework on our own with funding from Cirrus Com Community Investment Program, but we've always seen it as our contribution to a national digital literacy strategy that would bring together governments at all levels, as well as bodies like CIRA, the CRTC, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, along with key stakeholders from across the country in government, education and academia, industry, and other increasingly relevant sectors like healthcare to overcome the barriers to implementing digital literacy education for youth and adults across Canada and throughout their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. That's great. Um, we're going to take some questions again, same sort of format. Uh, so if you've got some questions, put your hands up. Um, a microphone will be right there. I'm going to start this one off, and this is a quick just go up and down the panel. Um, some of you were not here this morning. I, I did put, put the same question to our panel this morning. You may have heard the government's going to spend $500 million over five years on broadband. We asked some guys in the network business what they'd spend $500 million on. And Matthew, I'll put you first on the spot and we'll come back this way. If you had $500 million on a, quote, broadband strategy, where might some of that money go? Want to take a... Want to provide some advice to Minister Baines on that one? It's, here's your chance. Well, I don't know where we'd spend all 500 million of it. But uh, as I can say, a, a lot of that money needs to be going to creating and distributing resources for all of the people that help young people and adults become digitally literate in, in all of the dimensions of digital literacy. Uh, and certainly creating the resources is key, but also disseminating them providing support in using them because all too often resources are created and either they just sit on a website mm -hmm. or even if they are disseminated, there's not training that goes with them. But also we need to overcome the silos that exist, that all of the great work that is happening across the country so often is separated. Uh, and we see that even going from province to province. When I look every year at digital literacy curriculum, I see tremendous things happening in some provinces and other provinces that might as well be in 1980 from the looks of their curriculum. Um, and you, we see so much reinventing the wheel happening. We need to have the ability to bring people together within sectors like education, but also between sectors so that we can have a comprehensive digital literacy strategy that's operating at all levels of government. Sarah, does the Chamber of Commerce have any official policy on where this $500 million should go? Do you have any no. suggestions? No, but I will speak unofficially. All right, you go Just right ahead. Just within this room. Sure. Um, $500 million, first of all, is not enough. Let's just, just be clear, okay? So lay that on the table. Uh, but I will say from the business point of view, 
you've got to have businesses in communities right across this country have the level of broadband to actually conduct business. Mm -hmm. If we're concerned about export orientation or digital economy or e-commerce, you simply have to be able to function. And I know that that's not the case in, you know, I don't know, X number of the thousands of communities across this country. So maybe a first step, and maybe it's been done, uh, is to find out who has the biggest deficiency. Where is uh, the business appetite for stronger broadband or just broadband at all uh, greatest in terms of the economic and business potential in that community? So, you know, if you raised your hand and said, I really need it, our businesses are struggling, uh, maybe you should be, you know, on the list of those to qualify. A, a triage of sorts. Yeah, so. absolutely. I'm just throwing that out there. It's, this is me, not the chamber. All right. But you see the link to the chamber because all right, we've got 500, you know, chambers across the country. And of all I can tell you, sizes. And exactly. Yeah. Every part of this, this country is represented. And, and it's just fascinating. I'll get a phone call from somebody in Whitehorse or somebody, you know, on the rock. And, you know, it, uh, it really does come down to if you have the access, you can actually conduct business. All right, Tanya, how about you from a software? Again, the hardware guys say, oh, yeah, let's build it all on hardware. Uh, software folks might say what? Um, not speaking for them. Same no, disclaimer no. as Sarah, of course. Yes. Um, I think what Matthew pointed to was very important, and it's something that we've been um, speaking about a lot. It's understanding that education comes from a variety of places now um, to address an immediate need in the time frame that we have to try and do it to stay competitive economically and globally um, we need to basically call for all hands on deck and that's really hard when you're talking to teachers who only have so much time in a day and have to follow a program um, who's going to train them up who's going to help them be confident learn the skills include them in their lesson plans who's going to help parents um, there are organizations, we support one of them called Kids Code Jeunesse, um, that are working across Canada to try and make all of this very approachable um, and easy to use. But again, if you don't have access to the internet, you're not going very far. Um, so that's sort of a given that we need to have that. But, but then a plan for what is it going to be used for. Um, so there's that. I will also add um, that, you know, as I explained in my presentation, our companies are pretty small um, for all intents and purposes. They're not 50,000 you know, employee companies anymore. Um, so their key focus is to grow their business and keep it alive and sustainable. Um, asking them to take time away from their day-to-day -day operations and get out and pitch in to this kind of effort is, is difficult. It's a really difficult ask, but there's a huge willingness to do it maybe the government could create some incentives there and say, you know what, if you're a business that offers these kind of skills, do something in the community that's meaningful, add it to part, you know, add your efforts to part of a program maybe that exists or could be created. Um, and once you're involved, you know, everybody's better for your knowledge. So something like that would be good too. And Jeff, you hinted, if I uh, remember your presentation, about some funding to help low-income households just access the internet. But beyond that, um, where does $500 million go? Yeah, so, so let me say this about the $500 million. $500 million is going to go poof mm -hmm. right away. And there may be questions after the fact about where did that go, how, on what basis was it awarded, was it politicized, was it patronage, etc. And it's one time, uh, it's been announced, and I'm not sure there's any direction it's, or if it's been earmarked yet. So hopefully that will be consulted on. The Affordable Access Coalition has the two funds. There's the access fund so that the infrastructure is there where it's not currently there to deliver what Canadians all deserve, that basic level of broadband access. And then there's the affordability or low-income subsidy. It's a monthly amount that Canadians, low-income Canadians who are qualified can spend to lower their already very expensive telecom bills. Um, I think, uh, and so the coalition's proposed on the infrastructure side, $200 million a year user supported this would be this would likely be reflected in, in end user bills to fund on an annual basis on a sustainable basis contribution towards making sure all canadians have that level of basic broadband access no matter where they live which is something our research shows canadians are supportive of in principle and supportive in terms of uh paying for so i think so that and that's 200 million dollars on an annual basis it's transparent it's sustainable, it's renewable, whereas the 500 million one-time funding, poof, it's gone, because the, the, the closing the broadband gap 
um, has been estimated to be, you know, not a million dollar problem, but a billion dollar problem. So it's something that we're not going to solve overnight. So you want to do it sustainably, incrementally. Uh, and in terms of which communities get access to that money first, you want to have a transparent process in place to allocate the money to the extent that demand for that money outstrips supply, which is a very realistic scenario. And in that regard, the coalition I represented said there may be special community needs that should be prioritized. Certainly, um, First Nations uh, uh, concerns uh, come to mind. I'm not, I'm not sure businesses would be the first place to spend that type of money on. Uh, it, I, and I, I'm, ten, I'm inclined to argue. If the community does well, the people will be... No, no, I don't, I don't disagree with the, sort of the trickle-down trickle effect of that. But it's, it's, it's where there's also a productivity factor, I think, involved in connecting up households. Um, so anyway, there, there should be a process. All of, all of what I'm trying to say is that it's not a $500 million problem. Whatever problem we're talking about, if it's literacy or adoption or access, it's, it's a billion dollar problem. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it can't be ad hoc. It's got to have a strategy. And it sounds like the current government is sharpening its pencil to come out with a strategy. So th that's encouraging. And, and that is, uh, is, I think we've all heard, we've heard this uh, a few times today, that we do need some sort of coherent strategy with a champion somewhere. Okay, some questions. I think I, there's... Table 13, and then we'll come to 14, we'll come uh, to hi. 13. Uh, it's an unfortunate fact that Canada's digital environment is not an even playing field. And as our country falls behind in skills and education, there are certain groups that are further behind than others. Women, uh, low-income families, rural Canadians are often not receiving the same quality of education uh, and level of participation in the digital environment. And because they face a lot of different systemic barriers that we can't tear down in one day, but as a panel of experts in this area, uh, speaking to a room full of people in ICT organizations across Canada, what would you suggest that we can do to create a more diverse and egalitarian uh, industry and education system in Canada so that all Canadians can be represented in our economies? Well, why don't I throw this one to Matthew first? Do you want to try this? We can come back to it in a second, Daniel. If there, there are a number of different things we need to do because there are a no number of different barriers. Uh, as we've mentioned a number of times, the number one barrier is access. Uh, and we need to make access more widely available, and we need to do it in a way that's going to reach all Canadians. I mean, that's one of the reasons why getting good quality connections and networks in schools is so important. And I wanted to go back for a second to the question, the point you raised about sustainability, because you know, 20 years ago, Canada was a world leader in getting the internet in schools, both in terms of physically getting the wiring in schools, getting the signal in schools, but also supporting teachers in using the internet, using digital technology, teaching about digital technology, but also using those digital tools in their regular teaching. And now, as I said, again and again, what we hear from teachers, the number one complaint is network problems, slow bandwidth, outdated technology. So whatever we do, it has to be sustainable. And I think that's the big barrier that we're seeing when it comes to youth is not that the infrastructure isn't there, it's not that it was never there, with a few exceptions, um, but that it hasn't been maintained. A second thing, type of barrier is when we have people who are reluctant to enter the tech world uh, for cultural reasons, and we've heard that a number of th times where girls in particular and other m uh, groups may feel like it's not socially acceptable for them. They may be encountering conscious or unconscious bias. So there are things we need to do to address that. Uh, but a lot of it also is fear. We know from our research that boys and girls have very different experiences online, uh, that girls are a lot more likely to see the internet as a frightening place, a place where they're in danger. And a lot of that does seem to come from the fear narrative that has uh, dominated discussions of the internet and youth for the last 15 or 20 years. If parents are afraid of what's going to happen to their kids online, and we hear again and again from parents that they are, they're not going to encourage their kids, boys or girls, to get into coding. And so it's only going to be the ones that have a real strong desire who do it. Uh, so we have to deal with that. We do have to address the real issues, the real concerns about what kids do and what kids encounter online, but we have to do it in a rational way, and we have to do it in a way that empowers kids rather than trying to shield them. And Tanda, you wanted to jump in on this. You did a good job. 
going to say, Matthew, you steal my thunder again. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's okay. Um, I think it's a great question. And we did a bit of research, I mean a fair bit of research, and it's in our report, um, about the gender bias, because it's one that confronts us all the time, specifically the gender bias. Um, there's others, of course, you've raised a few, and I'll speak to those um, in a minute. But we were, you know, we were like, okay, fear. Fear is a topic, you know, women talk about a lot. We talk about fear, we're, we're raised to be a bit fearful. Um, and that's a societal issue, more broadly speaking, um, in a lot of cases than a tech problem, so to speak. Um, when I started this job, I remember I started, that's when the barrage of women in tech, and you're a woman in tech, and there you, you must know things, and tell us what the problem is. And it's like, I'm a lawyer, I don't know, we'll see. Um, but when I started speaking to my colleagues in, in the companies I work with, it wasn't that they were a woman and they wanted to be a trailblazer that got them there. It's that they were given the opportunity to learn. And um, a good researcher, I'd say good, he's probably awesome, um, out of Cambridge named Simon Peyton Jones has done some research on this with respect to our industry specifically. And on the stereotype and gender issue, um, it really does come down to that. It's stereotyping really, really, really young. And so what they realized was if we gave access and we gave exposure um, to technology and learning in a different kind of way, not just like, you know, I call it terrestrial, but, but real life, you know, balls and um, dolls and trucks and stuff, but actual like, let's learn and play this place um, when kids are four and five, that the likelihood of girls staying engaged and having their curiosity peaked was very, very high. Um, our friends in the U.S., a similar organization, has been working very closely with educators across the country with the Higher Education Video Game Alliance. And their research was showing there's a few points um, in the development of a child where girls in particular are falling off. Um, one is that very young age when they're learning the world around them and what they should be playing with and what their friends are playing with and peer pressure kind of starts. And then the next comes when math skills start to become emphasized. And the teachers, to their credit, are very aware of the curriculum they have, the time they have and everything else, but they're not given a variety of skills to equip them for the lack of confidence that girls are typically found to show. Um, and that happens around between 12 and 14, but typically kind of into high school when math gets a little bit trickier. Um, without the extra encouragement, they're falling off and they're saying, oh, I can't do this, I give up, who cares, it's not cool, move on. But with a little bit of extra encouragement, we're seeing amazing results. We're seeing it now, and I think in Canada, um, across a lot of different uh, schools and in different communities, but it's not widespread yet. Um, so I think really early, early education is the first point of intervention to show people that they can do this, anybody can do this, it's not scary and it's not exclusive. Um, this is a very inclusive place and it can be. Um, and then we get back to the access and the internet. So I have a small child, she happens to be a girl. I went into school, of course, being the person I am working for the companies I work for. And I said to the principal, her first day of kindergarten four, what are you teaching them on Khan Academy? Are you doing any coding? And are you using online? And she probably looked at me with like glassed over eyes and said, huh? I said, like, come on, really? No, we're worrying about play-based learning right now. And I said, oh, but you can play on the internet. Oh, we only have like 30 computers for the whole school and they go on a cart and they go from classroom to classroom and they tend to spend the most time with the grade seven and eights. That's a problem. And then she shared the spotty internet issue that their school has. The school's in Ottawa. There was no excuse for spotty internet, um, no excuse for outdated computers, no excuse for a limited amount of computers. So how do we solve all of these problems at once. It's not gonna happen with $500 million. It's gotta have um, a larger vision for the country. There's gotta be, we need the federal government to step up and say, okay, we see this. We're not sure we know maybe the perfect way to solve it, but we see this and we're gonna start carving off pieces and we're gonna talk to industry and we're gonna talk to educators and we're gonna talk to parents and we're gonna work on this together and of course with our provincial partners um, who have a lot of insight into these things. So. We're hoping we'll see some leadership. We're hoping we'll tackle um, some of the, the issues with people who have been less engaged, and hopefully we'll get there. Thanks. When we listened to uh, Mark Dupuy's presentation to hang 650-odd satellites, I thought that was a difficult problem, but this sounds like a much more difficult problem. <laughs> At the same table, we'll just do that first, and then we'll come down here to uh, Tim. A million dollars at your problems is a tactic, not a strategy. 
if that tactic doesn't serve a strategy, then yes, the money just goes poof. I haven't seen any evidence of a strategy that's being served by that tactic. Uh, in order to develop a strategy, you have to actually identify problems. And in Canada, the biggest problem that's emerging today with the internet is the concentration of ownership in the media. I would say this includes publishing as well as the internet. But when you have a very small number of owners for a very, very large business, it's not a buyer's market, it's a seller's market. And it won't really matter who gets the money, it'll just be wasted. It, how can I put this? In a free market economy, money doesn't trickle down. Money trickles up. Jeff, actually, uh, PIAC does a whole lot on concentration of ownership. I don't know if you have a comment on, on that. I, I don't know. Is it, what's your view? Is it, are we too concentrated, not enough, less? Would you get some thoughts on that? Well, PIAC regularly intervenes before Industry Canada on, on wireless and, and CRTC on, on telecom issues and, and broadcasting. Uh, to advocate for more competition, certainly there's a, there's a concentration problem. Uh, there, there was an expert in this room between WinSec of Carleton and the Canadian Media Concentration Research Project who documents this periodically. Um, the effect of that concentration uh, is a, well, concentration is that implies a lack of competition. Uh, lack of competition implies high prices. The basket of communication services that, or the monthly amount that Canadians spend uh, on, communi on communication service has been going up like that. It's been outstripping the, the pace of inflation. Certainly there's an, a, an element of demand to that. There may be more demand, but in, in many cases you're seeing Canadians getting either less for more or they're getting charged more for the, the same type of service or the same entry level type of smart form plan. So it's certainly a problem. And so what do we, what do, we do about, uh, afford, do you, ask the regulator, there's a regulator behind all of this on, on broadcasting and telecom. Do you say there, there's market failure or there's a problem here? Start regulating rate, rates. I think that would be a very difficult ask to do, I'll even though the daily experience is that, yes, there is a lack of competition. So that's why the group I represent has asked for an affordability subsidy. I, I will note just one more point. The CRTC has come back and has floated an idea of, of offering Canadians a mandated price uh, uh, a basic broadband package to all, a uniform one to all Canadians with us with a price cap price ceiling um, which may be one one solution to this but it, it it's all in response to the failure of the market to address a problem that's the problem that the strategy needs to address we're going to come down to uh, table number 10 if a microphone right somewhere down around here Okay, thank you. This is a question from an economist. Um, both this morning and this afternoon, we talked about the problems of, of productivity in the Canadian economy. We talked about efficiency in government. We talked about a lack of skills. There's an area that I've been asked to work in recently that is plaguing me, and that's the, the public perception and the private reality of what's coming down the pipe in the Internet of Things. And I don't want to go into the security and privacy issues or the toys for boys and all of that, but when you look at the numbers and the predictions, most of the Internet of Things is going to be lodged in the industrial sector and in government. Only a little bit of it is going to be in the household. So there are questions about the skills for the Internet of Things or productivity in the industrial sector and the skills and awareness in the government sector or where the Internet of Things is going to transform governance in the operation of government. That looks like a big pothole in the road for a strategy going forward. Are there any comments on that? Sarah, do you want to try a bit there? Sure. I will, and you'll have to cut me off because I could talk. I, I, this is really fascinating, important, and unpredictable, as is the future, right? But we do know a few things. Um, we do know that you know robotics, AI are all sort of taking root, uh, starting to infiltrate, starting to displace. There's varying predictions in terms of the numbers of jobs and the types of jobs. But we know in terms of 
uh, numbers and types that will be displaced, but we do know that there will be a degree of, of substitution uh, going on. What we, I, I think, haven't um, come to terms with is of all of that that is starting to happen as, you know, Baxter, this robot is available for $22,000 US and $3 an hour. I mean, you can see him very easily going into a small or medium-sized manufacturing firm and displacing, right? At that price point, it gets attractive. So, you know, we have to start to come to terms with what then are the skills and what then are the types of jobs that we could foresee growing in this world? Because we know, if you looked at, you know, uh, years ago when uh, GM and other car manufacturers were ruling the world, you know, there were thousands of jobs. Those jobs have diminished in number greatly. And Google, as it grows, is not creating the jobs in the same degree, in the same numbers as those old manufacturing. So this shift to this fourth industrial age or the second machine age, however we characterize it, we've got to come to terms and, and really uh, have a discussion about uh, the types of skills and the types of job categories that we could see potentially growing. And, and I think that's where the federal government has a real responsibility to start to do what ICTC and other organizations do, which is a bit of a forecasting. Not beyond five years, I think 10 years is, but I think in respect of, of, of some of the categories I talked about, we need to really get a handle on what this fundamental set of changes might mean for uh, our skills needs and then our education piece and, uh, and the nature of work, the future of work. And uh, you know, there, it's happening you know, at Davos with the World Economic Forum, so you know, the leading lights from around the world talk about this, but is it happening at our level? Is it happening at a, at a point at which you know, we can really uh, start to take grasp of, of you know, there may no longer be some of these very manual routine jobs in the future economy. There may be jobs that will require uh, you know, certain other types of skills that we have to start to you know, embed in our thinking as part of the nature of work. Um, so that's not very specific uh, answer to your question, but I think it's a really important topic and I'd like to see some, some leadership. Of course, it's so unpredictable and it's so um, scary that politically it's unpalatable. So, We've got time for one last question, I think. Table 12, right uh, behind you there. Yeah, I just wanted to tie in a bit of this morning's talk about access and, and access to infrastructure and your internet of things sort of inspired me on that as well. But um, the differential access people have between like broadband online on a computer and broadband online on a mobile phone, the, the things you can do on a device, especially in terms of productivity and labor creation and future of jobs, uh, it's very different what you can do on a mobile phone than what you can do on a, on a computer. So in terms of, and yet you see more and more people are, are moving to mobile. In your opinion, and this is a question for all of you, um, how can we manage that, that access and skills gap between um, what people are learning on a phone? Do you think mobiles are going to uh, become more and more um, content creation friendly? Uh, or are we going to lose a, a, a significant number of people who don't have access to two desktops and, and two computers and, and to all the, the programs that are available on those? Um, in the future. But Matthew, why don't you give a crack at this? I don't know if you have time for everybody to chime in on this, but Matt, yeah, Matt, do you want to tr try that one a bit? I think w there's two things we need to do, because we certainly know from our own research that young people are more and more using mobile devices to go online, and obviously that provides us with a host of issues um, that we can really only touch on right now. Uh, so one of the things that we need to do as with any technology, is to really encourage young people and encourage their teachers to understand 
the full capacities of these devices. Because yeah, we can say they are more limited, and that's true, but at the same time, there's a lot of evidence that we're not using them to their full capacity. I mean, as I said, when you consider how few kids do any kind of media production in their classroom, when you can make a film with a phone. Uh, so we do need to uh, empower teachers to use them more efficiently. And kids are bringing so much technology into the classroom. We do have to do a little bit of judo and say, how can we use what's coming in? How can we do, use it safely? How can we use it fairly so that the kids who maybe don't have the best device aren't left out? Um, how can we use it in a way that's meeting the educational goals, not just relating to digital literacy, but to the classroom in general? But we also are seeing, anecdotally, we're hearing a lot of schools are turning away from mobile devices in the classroom. They're going back towards uh, things like laptops. They tend to be less featured laptops, but they're turning back. Um, so we do need to make sure that, uh, that they're getting support there as well, that they are getting the network quality that they need, they are getting the training that they need, so that students will grow up, we might say, bilingual in the two, to, in the two technologies, so that they do know there, there are more powerful platforms and they do know how to use them at the same time as they're getting the most out of the devices that they use on a daily basis. All right, and sitting patiently uh, throughout our discussion here at the end there has been Jerry, Jeremy DePoe of the Canadian Internet Policy Forum, and his task now is to give us some takeaways. You've been uh, making some notes here, Jeremy. What have you got for us? Well, I think, first of all, um, you know, observing this discussion and at the forum, we've been, we've been looking at this issue for, uh, for the past several months. And one thing that I think we have to ground all our discussion is, is that Canada is not alone. This isn't just a uniquely Canadian problem. And there's a, a global race to solve it with public policy and be in a position to compete for this, uh, this new economy. And um, I, I guess from a takeaway perspective, I kind of see, you know, there's the domestic policy landscape that we've talked about, which includes, you know, the K to 12, or some people call it, talk about K to 8, and then 9 to 12, and what's the, what's the, the right approach there? And then post-secondary, what's, what's the right approach? And then after that, we've talked about, uh, touched a little bit on lifelong, lifelong learning. So um, you're not going to complete your education anymore once you receive your BA or your master's or your PhD. It's going to be an ongoing uh, learning process as technologies develop. And then we have the whole gender gap issue, which um, has been identified and is a serious one, um, especially when you're looking for creative people. And, um, and, and lastly, labor displacement. You know, how, how are we going to prepare for that? And, and what are we going to do um, to ensure that there is a proper social plan um, in order to uh, um, deal with, you know, the truck driver that loses his job to a, a self-driving vehicle, for example. And that may sound kind of extreme, but it's actually, it's actually not. Um, the other piece is that I've kind of heard throughout is that this, this isn't just an economic issue. It's not just about a particular sector. Um, it's a really a socioeconomic, there's socioeconomic value out of this. And if we ensure that Canadians throughout um, demog demographics have the right skills, then not only does there a positive value to the economy, um, but there's also tremendous social value. I was um, at an event not, not long ago where there was the launch um, of a, uh, a program for uh, internet access to low-income housing, and there was a woman that got up, and she, um, she was part of the community, and I, th I think this person may have testified in one of the, the House of Commons uh, uh, or, or CRTC hearings as well, but she called the Ottawa li Library to reserve a computer. And they told her, well, you have to do that online. <laughs> and so 
in that kind of environment, how do you access the social programs that you need because they're online? How do you um, find educational opportunities? How do you find employment opportunities? That's a, that's a real, uh, real barrier to being able to participate and, and you know, become not only a, uh, a cons I think we've also talked about, and that your mobility question was a good one. Um, are we just consuming information or are we creating value with those tools? And that's a totally different, uh, totally different thing. And I think we need to get to the place where we have those, Sarah, you've mentioned the, the creativity skills, the problem solving skills. Those are clearly deficits that we have in Canada. And um, we need um, some kind of uh, uh, approach to do that. And I tend to agree with you that, and it's, it is a bit controversial, and, but we often get stuck into the debate of, well, education's a provincial issue, so we can't really touch it federally. Well, I don't think that's necessarily an excuse for lack of federal leadership and lack of um, putting resources into coordinating and assisting provinces and working together and exchanging information. Um, so there's there's lots of notes that I've 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 taken, um, but really I think those are the, the 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 key points that I'd like to like to touch on, and um, you know specifically the pervasiveness of this across uh, sectors, and that um, it's not uh, it's not just about digital sector and making sure we've got a strong um, uh, ICT industry, it crosses a, a, you know, throughout the economy. And um, that's where we, we need to realize that there is tremendous economic and well, socioeconomic value to having the right strategy in place. So I think it's, from my perspective, it's time to move from, you know, we've identified the problem there are uh, some ideas to solve it, but we really need to switch the discussion now to what's the strategy to, in, this, in the actual actions, or moving strategy into, into action. And, and I take your point, uh, with the 500 million not having a clear strategy behind it, it is a tactic. Um, we need a, a, a comprehensive digital strategy in Canada. All right, thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you, Matthew, Sarah, Tanya, and Jeff. Uh, round of applause for our panel. Thank you, folks, that was great.